Okay, so this is week number four. Uh, and after we've covered storage models in disk, as well as the boot process partitions and the Unix file system, we'll spend a fair chunk of the videos for this week on the topic of software and more specifically how to install it and how to manage it. In our last video, now we already talked a bit about the file system hierarchy and look at the higher seven no, manual page. And we found out that there is a reason for uh, why, of course, <clears throat> again, in our last uh, discussion, no. We already talked a bit about the file system hierarchy and look at the higher seven, no manual page. And we found out that there is a reason for why we have a certain directory structure, which tell us which software parts go where. This will be something we will get back to when we talk about package management and software installation in particular. Uh, in in its most general definition, no? software is just another term for a program telling a computer to perform a certain task. Practically, no. however, there are a number of different types of software and we've already seen some of them as part of our discussion of voting a system. No? In this uh, discussion, we will attempt to categorize these types no? even though the distinctions of differentiating factors are far from clear cut as you will quickly notice. We have already identified a specific component that happens to be implemented in software, of course, the file system. Okay, instinct Actively, no, we categorize the file system as being in the lower layer, then certain applications such as a web server, for, like, for example, but the file system is only one component of the operating system, which in turn comprises regular application software, such as text editor or a compiler. Software libraries used by many of these applications, uh, such as resolver library, used to turn host names into IP addresses. Device drivers providing access to and control of certain hardware components and the most central components of the OS itself, the kernel. No? Looking at software from this perspective quickly makes it clear that the term operating system itself requires some definition as different OS providers include different components under this um, umbrella term. But before we attempt to tackle the questions of what exactly defines an operating system, let us take a step back and attempt to better categorize software based on its proximity to the hardware or to the user. Okay, so firmware. Firmware is a software that provides basic machine structure, instructions that allow the hardware to functions and communicate with other software running on a device. A Linux firmware is a package distributed alongside the Linux kernel that contains firmware binary blobs, no? necessary for partial or full functionality of certain hardware devices. And these binary blobs are usually proprietary because some hardware manufacturers do not release really source code necessary to build the firmware itself. Modern uh, graphics, no? uh, cards from AMD and NVIDIA or in, uh, NVIDIA, no? almost certainly required blobs to be 
loaded for the hardware to operate correctly. Starting at Broxton, no, a Skylake-based microarchitecture, Intel of course CPUs required by Nari Blobs for additional low power uh, idle states, no, the DMC. Uh, graphics, no, uh, workload, <coughs> scheduling of the various graphics parallel engines, and offloading some media functions from the CPU to GPU. Additionally, modern Intel Wi-Fi chip sets no? uh, almost always required blobs. No? For security reason, hot loading firmware into a running kernel has been shown uh, upon. And a modern in its system, such as System D, have strongly discouraged loading firmware from user space. Actually, this is an example or an illustration of devices with firmware. And the same setup utility. Well, this boot screen is being displayed, you can press a designated key to run the CMOS setup program. The CMOS setup is used to configure BIOS and chipset settings, ranging from those as obvious as the date and time, as what we have here, no? <clears throat> to those as obscure uh, as memory timings in bus settings. If you're running a modern version of Linux such as Ubuntu, you may be able to get uh, to the BIOS by typing sudo systemctl reboot no, firmware at the command prompt. So after installing and rebooting, the computer will boot from the hard disk. If everything went well, you're looking at the login prompt <clears throat> within a few seconds or minutes depending on your hardware, of course. And the system is not yet fully configured, but basic configuration is easy. And you will see how to quickly configure some important things. And in doing so, you will learn some basic about how the system works. Now, Kernel is the essential foundation of a computer's operating system. No? It is the core that provides basic services for all other parts of the OS. It is the main layer between the OS and underlying computer hardware, and it helps with tasks such as process and memory management, file systems, device control, and networking. <clears throat> During normal system startup, no? a computer basic input-output system or BIOS completes a hardware bootstrap or initialization, and then runs a bootloader uh, which loads the kernel from a storage device, such as a hard drive. So into a protected memory space. So once the kernel is loaded into computer memory, the BIOS transfer control to the kernel. Uh, it then loads other OS components to complete the system startup and make control available to users through a desktop or other user interface. <clears throat> if the kernel is damaged or cannot load successfully, the computer will be unable to start completely, if at all. This will require service to correct hardware damage or restore the operating system kernel to a working version. Uh, in, in broad terms, no, an OS kernel performs three primary jobs. Uh, number one, it provides the interfaces needed for users and applications to interact with the computer. Number two, it launches and manages uh, applications. And number three, it manages the underlying system hardware devices. In more granular terms, no, accomplishing these three kernel functions involves a range of computer tasks, including, of course, loading and managing less critical OS components such as device drivers, organizing and managing threads and the various processes spawned by running applications, scheduling which applications can access and use the kernel and supervising the use when the scheduled time occurs. 
deciding which non-protected user memory space each application process use, handling conflicts and errors in memory allocation and management, managing and optimizing hardware resources and dependencies, such as central processing unit and cache use, file system operations, and network transport mechanism. Of course, managing and accessing input-output devices, such, such as keyboards, mice, no, disk drives, USB ports, network adapters, and displays, and handling device and application system calls using various mechanisms such as hardware interrupts or device driver. Scheduling and management are central to the kernel's operation So, because computer hardware can only do one thing at a time. However, a computer's OS components and applications can spawn dozens and ha even hundreds of processes that the computer must host. It's impossible for all of those processes to use the computer's hardware, such as memory address or CPU instruction pipeline at the same time. So the kernel is the central manager of these processes. It knows which hardware resources are available and which processes need them. It then allocates time for each process to use those resources. So <clears throat> the kernel is critical to a computer's operation and it requires careful protection within, within the system memory. So the kernel space it loads uh, into a protected area of memory and uh, that protected memory space ensures other applications of data and data don't override or impair the kernel causing uh, performance problems, instability or other negative consequences. Instead, applications are loaded and executed in a generally <clears throat> available use memory space. Uh, a kernel is open construct uh, cons contrasted with a shell, which is the outermost part of the OS that interacts with user commands. Kernel and shell are terms used more frequently in Unix OSs than in IBM, mainframe, and Microsoft Windows systems. <clears throat> a kernel is not to be confused with a BIOS, no, which is an independent program stored on a chip within a computer circuit board. So, operating system. An operating system is the most important software that runs on a computer. It manages the computer's memory and processes, as well as of its software and hardware. It, it also allows you to communicate with the computer without knowing how to speak the computer's language without an operating system. <clears throat> A computer is useless. No? Your computer's operating system manages all of the software and hardware on the computer. Most of the time, there are several different computers running or computer programs running at the same time. <clears throat> and they all need to access your computer central processing unit, memory, and storage. <clears throat> The operating system coordinates all of this to make sure each program gets what it needs. Operating system usually come preloaded on, a, on <clears throat> any computer you buy. And most people use the operating system that comes with their computer. But it's possible to upgrade or even change operating system. <clears throat> and the three most common operating system for personal use are Microsoft, Windows, <clears throat> Mac OS no, and Linux. A modern operating system use a graphical user interface or GUI. No? A GUI lets you use your mouse to click icons, buttons, and menus, and everything is clearly displayed on the screen using a combination of graphics and text. Each operating system's GUI has a different look and feel. So if you switch to a different operating system, <clears throat> It may seem uh, unfamiliar at first. However, modern operating systems are designed to be easy to use <clears throat> and most of the basic principles are the same. <clears throat> Microsoft created the Windows operating systems in the mid-1980s. No? There, ha there have been many different versions of Windows, but the most recent one are <clears throat> Windows 11. No? 
<clears throat> Actually, Windows 10 releases 2015, no? Uh, Windows 8, uh, 2012, no? Windows 7, 2009. <clears throat> Windows Vista, 2007. <clears throat> Windows come preloaded on most new PCs, which help to make it the most popular operating system in the world. No? Mac OS, previously called OS X, <clears throat> Uh, is a line of operating system created by Apple. It comes preloaded on all Macintosh computers or Macs. No? Some of the <clears throat> specific version include Mojave, no? uh, High Shera, and Shera. <clears throat> According to uh, Stat Counter Global Stats, no? <clears throat> Mac OS users account for less than 10% of global operating system, much lower than the percentage of Windows user, which is more than 80%. <clears throat> One reason for this is that Apple computers tend to be more expensive. However, many people do prefer the look and feel of Mac OS over Windows. Another is Linux. No, <clears throat> uh, Linux is a family of open source operating system, which means they can be modified and are distributed by anyone around the world. This is different from proprietary no, software like Windows, which can only be modified... <clears throat> by the company that owns it. No? The advantages of Linux are that <clears throat> it is free and there are many different distributions or versions you can choose from. <clears throat> so Linux users for less than 2% of global operating systems, however, most servers run Linux because it's relatively easy to <clears throat> customize. To learn more about different distributions of Linux, uh, maybe you just uh, read... <clears throat> or research on Ubuntu, Linux, Mean, uh, and Fedora website, or refer to the Linux resources. For a more comprehensive list, you can visit Make uh, Use of List of the Best Linux Distributions. <clears throat> operating System for Mobile Devices, no, another thing. No? The operating system we've been talking about so far were designed to run on desktop and laptop computers. <clears throat> but... <clears throat> Mobile devices such as phones, tablet, computers, and MP4 players are different from desktop and laptop computers. So they run operating systems that are designed specifically for mobile devices. <clears throat> Example of mobile operating systems include Apple iOS and Google Android. <clears throat> in the screen, uh, in the, of course, in, in some of the sample, you can see iOS running on an iPad. Operating system for mobile device generally aren't as fully featured as those made for desktop and laptop computers. And they aren't able to run all of the same software. However, you can still do a lot of things with them, like watch movies, <clears throat> browse the web, manage your calendar, and play games. <clears throat> as we have encountered an error while detecting hardware, we must consult the system lab. No. <clears throat> Next will be the system software. No? System software is a type of computer program that is, that is designed to run a computer's hardware and application program. <clears throat> if we think of the computer systems as a layered model, the system software is the interface between the hardware and users' applications. So, <clears throat> so the operating system is the best known example of system software. And the OS manages all the other programs in a computer. <clears throat> System software is used to manage the computer itself. It runs in the background, maintaining the computer's basic functions so users can run <clears throat> high-level application software to perform certain tasks. Now, essentially, system software provides a platform for application software to be run on top of. No? <clears throat> so important uh, features of system software, of course, <clears throat> Computer manufacturers usually develop the system software as an integral part of the computer. The primary responsibility of the software is to create an interface between the computer hardware, the manufacturer, and the end user. <clears throat> so system software generally includes <clears throat> high speed, no? uh, hard to manipulate, written in a low-level computer language, and close the system. No? <clears throat> For the versatility, versatile no? system software must communicate with both the specialized hardware it runs on and the higher level application software that is usually hardware agnostic and open has no direct connections to the hardware it runs on. 
System software also must support other programs that depend on it as they evolve and change. System software manage the computer's basic functions, including the disk operating system, file management utility software, and <clears throat> operating system. Other example of system software uh, include the following of the BIOS, no? basic input output, gets the computer system started after it's turned on, <clears throat> and manage the data flow between the OS and attach <clears throat> devices such as the hard drive, video adapter, keyboard, mouse, and printer. <clears throat> the boot program no? Load, uh, loads the OS into the computer's main memory or random access memory or RAM. No? <clears throat> Uh, an assembler, no, it takes a basic computer instruction and converts them into a pattern of bits that the computer's processor can use to perform its basic operations. A device driver, no, it controls a particular type of device that is attached to your computer, such as keyboard or mouse. So the driver program converts the more general input-output instruction of the operating system to messages that the device type can understand. Excuse. So this will be an example, no? Of let's say uh, available um, applications like Bash, Cat, no, Switch Mode, CP, and others. <clears throat> so, a software suite is a group of application programs and. The four different types are productivity, specialized, utility, and personal. Customized software for some specific organization or other use. Huh? So this will be an example of a software applications. Now Java, Apache, Git, no Oracle, no, and so on. Okay, this one of course uh, include Vimeo, no Hulu Plus, Netflix, Spotify, no. <clears throat> And so on. Now, we have the shared kernels now, as what we have then the Linux container and shared kernels. <clears throat> shared kernel virtualization, also called operating system virtualization or system level virtualization, take advantage of the unique ability of Unix and Linux to share their kernels with other processes on the system. <clears throat> the shared kernel virtualization is achieved. Uh, by using a feature called change root. No? Kernel duplicate uh, file binder scan windows uh, <clears throat> folder or drives for duplicate files of almost all types and mark or remove duplicate files. <clears throat> and of course, uh, this will be the summary of our discussion. <clears throat> Software is not like a car, no? <clears throat> Software is uh, e a software is a software even when it's firmware or middleware. We tend to group software into low level or firmware, OS, add-on software, <clears throat> and we differentiate already. Uh, uh, and uh, understand on how to manage its category. Okay. So this will be the link actually for this discussion. No. <clears throat> I just want to show you a video presentations uh, related to the discussion about type of software. Hello, and welcome back to CSX15 System Administration. This is week 4, and after we've covered storage models and disks, as well as the boot process, partitions, and the Unix file system, we'll spend a fair chunk of the videos for this week on the topic of software, and more specifically, how to install it and how to manage it. In our last video, we already talked a bit about the file system hierarchy and a look at the here manual page, and we found out that there's a reason for why we have a certain directory structure, which tells us which software parts go where. This will be something we will get back to when we talk about package management and software installation in particular. In its most general definition, software is just another term for a program telling a computer to perform a certain task. Practically, however, there are a number of different types of software, and we've already seen some of them as part of our discussion of booting a system. 
In this video, we will attempt to categorize these types, even though the distinctions or differentiating factors are far from clear-cut, as you will quickly notice. We've already identified a specific component that happens to be implemented in software, the file system. Instinctively, we categorize the file system as being in a lower layer than certain applications, such as the web server, for example. But the file system is only one component of the operating system, which in turn comprises regular application software, such as a text editor or a compiler, software libraries used by many of these applications, such as the resolver library, used to turn host names into IP addresses, device drivers providing access to and control of certain hardware components, and the most central component of the OS itself, the kernel. Looking at software from this perspective quickly makes it clear that the term operating system itself requires some definition, as different OS providers include different components under this umbrella term. But before we attempt to tackle the question of what exactly defines an operating system, let us take a step back and attempt to better categorize software based on its proximity to the hardware or the end user. And what better way to do that than to compare software or the operating system to a car? People always like to compare other things to cars for some reason. I suspect this is because we all see cars all the time and thus believe that everybody understands how cars work. But alright, let's try and roll with this. When we boot up a system, we've seen that before our operating system is up and running, a bunch of things happen on a lower layer. So we clumsily represent this part here via this diagram of the ignition system. The analogous element in the world of computers might then be firmware. That is, the bits of software executing early on when we power on our system would fall into this category. But firmware is even more widespread. It covers, for example, the software running on your Wi-Fi access point. Now, this illustrates that it's quite difficult to properly categorize software. We know that a switch or router runs a full operating system, albeit a specialized one. And many of the consumer products do as well, frequently use customized versions of, for example, Linux. But since we often have no way of updating or managing the software, we consider it to be not quite so soft, and so we group this under firmware as well. Other devices that may be running some sort of firmware include things like remote controls, which nowadays can be of surprising complexity. Or, say, your car's infotainment and navigation system. Again, these days your car is more likely to run a full-fledged operating system here, but as a user it remains largely opaque to us. Perhaps a bit lower level, but something we've also mentioned before, includes the electronics embedded in an IDE drive or really anything using USB. And as we also mentioned earlier, the fact that all these things are running some sort of software, firmware, means that they can be manipulated or compromised. Now, back to our server systems. The system BIOS certainly qualifies as a type of firmware, and it is embedded in the read-only memory but can be updated via special tools flashing the ROM, for example. Similarly, different persistent memory modules such as NVRAM, as shown here by example of an old Spark station, that then also function as a first stage bootloader. As we can see, there are ways to change the state of the system here in an interactive way. As a bootloader, it then eventually hands control off to the kernel. Now, back to our terrible car analogy, what would we say represents the kernel? Well, Perhaps we can think of the kernel as the motor. Without it, your car is pretty useless. But similarly, if all you have is a kernel, well, then you aren't going to get anywhere either. This, by the way, is why, as annoying as it may be, it actually is technically correct, the best kind of correct, to insist on saying the OS is called GNU Linux. But we don't have to be pedantic. Anyway, so our kernel is a piece of software. As you may know, there are different types of OS kernels, microkernels as well as monolithic kernels. The latter are the common kernels you'll find in the Unix systems we're looking at in this class. And so we've already seen a way to visualize what the kernel does. By looking at the boot messages, we see that it manages the hardware, manages memory and process scheduling, and provides the system calls for the regular user land libraries to interact with. But again, just like a motor all by itself, so is a kernel all by itself of limited use. What we need to build a more useful environment in which we can build our services is the core operating system.
That is, all the bits and pieces that are not running in kernel space, but that are necessary for the system to become useful, usable. The operating system needs to be tightly integrated with the kernel. You can't just take a motor and plunk it into any chassis and think it'll work. You need compatible parts and connectors that fit. Likewise, the kernel is not independent from the rest of the system. And this is where things get a bit hairy. You all know that there exist many Unix versions, but those all remain their own coherent operating system. But with Linux, for example, we have many different variations of combining the Linux kernel with certain tools, many of which are the same or similar across distributions, to build an OS variation. Some distributions use the init startup system, others use systemd, for example. Some ship with version X of library Y, others with version X plus 1. So you have core libraries that need to hook into the kernel and that really aren't completely independent of it. But on top of that, you also have a number of system components that specifically define how your operating system behaves and how users interact with it. You get additional functionality, but a lot of the functionality is quite involved in how to operate the system, how to interact with it, how to change settings. For us, perhaps the equivalent here is system software, core components of the OS, as well as the bits that influence their behavior, the configuration files and the like. Again, all of these are tied primarily to the operating of the system itself. And so most of the time, people have a need to extend the system, to add customizations, to buy some add-ons. In the software world, the equivalent to these sexy fuzzy wheel cover and pimped out seats, we might consider as add-ons, things like a web server, a database, an additional programming language interpreter with its libraries, a language platform and virtual machine, a calendar mail system editor IDE kitchen sinkimatron, or a revision control system that nobody knows how it works. Now you're probably wondering, hey, wait a second, my OS comes with all of these out of the box. Those aren't add-on packages or customizations. But therein lies a dilemma and a larger discussion we'll go into in our next video. Deciding what software components are part of the OS, what is strictly speaking an add-on, what is core system software, and what is optional pink fuzzy frills. But besides the categories we've so far identified, firmware, kernel, operating system, system software, and add-on applications, we also increasingly have to deal with systems that fall in between. Since nowadays just about every device that you can plug into a power outlet comes with a full-fledged, insecure configured operating system running a web server that you can't turn off. And even though we may not always think about these devices and focus on server environments, it's useful to remember that the same principles do apply when managing embedded devices and non-compute resources brought into your network. What's more, all these separations of types of software fall further apart as we move into the area of virtualization, containers, and say, unikernels. Is a static immutable container an instance of an operating system, or is it more akin to firmware or a closed system application? Does the hypervisor in a virtualized environment count as a proper operating system? And where do individual applications running inside containers on the unit kernel fall? Well, I'm afraid I don't have answers for you other than it depends and it gets messy real quick. But hey, welcome to the wonderful world of system administration. As I said, we'll try to bring in a little more clarity to some of this in the coming videos, when we talk about software bundling and installation and the separation of system software from the OS. But first, let's try to summarize what we covered today. First of all, and I hope this much should be very clear, software really is not at all like a car. Car analogies are almost always pretty awful. Next, and even though this sounds obvious, we sometimes forget. All of this software we're talking about is indeed software. That is, it's flexible, can be changed, can be configured, can be compromised. That is, many of the principles we'll apply when we talk about package management, software updates, or security principles in the coming videos all apply more or less equally to firmware as to the base OS as to add-on software. And so these are really the three broad groups we tend to divide software in. The low-level firmware, by which we often mean software that we generally do not change, that sits very close to the hardware and that may be proprietary or require special tools to interface with. 
the cooperating system, although we've already gotten a taste that it's not really a very clear-cut definition, no obvious line that separates add-on software from system software. But we do determine that there's some software that we consider to not be part of the operating system, and that we would need to add after OS installation, for example. But with these categories, we then immediately get to these questions. What really is the main difference? Is there one, perhaps, when it comes to how we manage the software? And what about all these other in-between things we mentioned, all the terrible internet of broken things? What about network gear, storage equipment, a special purpose hardware such as an HSM, or third-party appliances? Well, perhaps this video here has really only led us to more questions than answers, but it's probably a good idea for you to start thinking in these terms before we move on to software package management in our next video. So as a look back, as well as in preparation for that topic, you should perhaps go back to the different boot sequences you looked at from last week, and try to identify the different types of software you encountered and how they interact with one another. Then think about what the impact is of trying to update each one. Is that a straightforward thing? Can you make a change to one without the other? What things do you have to consider when you do that? Answers to some of these questions will be given in our next video. So until the next time, and thanks for watching. Cheers. Okay, so in our last video, no, we were we just uh, spent some time discussing the different types of software, and we did uh, draw a distinction between the operating system, so the OS, and several other types of software. So why don't we start out uh, thinking about how we get one of those things, one of this operating system onto our day? So uh, we will do just that, no, install an OS, but of course. Remembering that we want to keep scale, uh, scalability as a core pillar in our mind. <coughs> yes. we, don't, we don't just worry about getting an OS installed in this uh, one time on this one box, but rather how to ensure we can do this in an automated fashion across hundreds or thousands of systems. <coughs> and before we can do that, <coughs> we should probably come up with a plan of what file should go where. So the following is an overview of the procedures that are needed to install a new operating system. Now we need to set up the display environment. <clears throat> now, uh, if you are not using the optional DBD drive for preparing the system for OS installation, in installing the OSC, accessing the server output during uh, installation. <clears throat> we need to erase the primary boot disk. No? If you have an operating system pre-installed on the server, you will need to remove it before installing a new operating system. Okay? Set up the, the BIOS, no? <clears throat> Install the operating system <clears throat> and configure your server uh, for RAID, no? And install the operating system, update the drivers, <clears throat> and run operating system updates as necessary. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> this will be the variable versus the static and shareable versus non-shareable data. <clears throat> so variable data expected to be modified during uh, routine operations, <clears throat> static data not expected to change during time, no? shareable data that remains the same across multiple uh, hosts, no? <clears throat> and non-shareable data that is unique no? to <clears throat> a specific system. <clears throat> and uh, of course, we have here the installation summary, no? let's say, Send OS ang in-install natin. No? We have the localization, <coughs> the software, and the system. Uh, this will be the NetBSD, no? uh, forward slash x86, no? wherein uh, we could be able to boot normally, but single users drop to boot from. No? <coughs> and uh, as a choice, an option return for default no? is space to stop a uh, countdown. No? Option one will be chosen in five seconds, actually, no? as we perform. And this will be the menu-driven tool uh, designed to help you install NetBSD to hard disk no? or upgrade an existing <clears throat> uh, NetBSD system with a minimum of work. So as what we have here, 
uh, under net uh, BSD 9.1. We have installed net BSD to hard disk, upgrade net BSD on a hard disk, reinstall set or install additional sets, reboot the computer, no utility menu, config menu, and <coughs> exit install system. <coughs> Of course, uh, let's say, for example, if you may encountered uh, bad sectors, no? if you wanted actually to, to found out no, the, uh, as, as, you, as what we have here, no, the total sectors, no? <clears throat> the RPM also uh, with this. No? And uh, for the 639 versus 10475529, no? we bought normally, bought single user, drop to boot prompt. No? <clears throat> then, of course, in OS installation, we need to consider the power up, the PXC or IPXC boot, no network configuration, no boot from network by a TFTP, TF, TF, no menu root. <clears throat> you need to identify root device in optional additional disk, no create a partition table or disk label, no create file systems, <clears throat> install MBR, no boot uh, blocks in others. So we, we are all familiar with MBR because we discussed it, we discussed it already with our previous modules, no. Fits OS of software, no HTTPS, ISC, uh, SI, we already discussed all those things. Install, copy, or extract OS. <clears throat> Optionally, add application software. No, if you if you want to add some additional uh, software, it's also possible. Perform basic system configuration and <clears throat> reboot. Okay? So most of the difficult parts happen outside of the building system. <clears throat> it's the hardware identification, provisioning, and registration. <clears throat> Identification of suitable base OS installation, installation of add-on applications, no? <clears throat> initial minimum system configuration, system registration, and system restart. No? <clears throat> Excuse. So this will be a more modern no, approach no, for the OS installation. And this will be the summary. No? Conceptually, the OS installation is simple. No? Thinking about the static, viable, shareable, and shareable data helps you define not only partitioning schemas, but also improve scalability of your processes. A lot of work and difficult automating allies in configuring and customizing the installation. As you scale up, OS installation quickly leaks into configuration management <coughs> and service orchestration. You need to compare the installation of NetBSD, FreeBSD, OmniOS, Ubuntu, and CentOS in a virtual machine. And how you automate the process, no? research tools that would help, no? Uh, how does this compare to the process of creating an AMI? You no, know? what are the implications of creating an image suitable for use in such an environment, and what are the requirements of the infrastructure? Uh, I think you need to be familiar with AUS, no, because at present, no, especially right now, uh, trends will be the AUS, no. <clears throat> there are certain actual certifications for AUS also, and this will be the link. No? I just want to play a video presentations, a discussions about the OS installation, it will display on how we'll be able to install an operating system, okay? Hello, and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. This is week four, segment two. In our last video, we just spent some time discussing the different types of software, and we did draw a distinction between the operating system, the OS, and several other types of software. So why don't we start out thinking about how we get one of those things, one of these operating systems, onto our disk? In this video, we do just that, install an OS. But of course, remembering that we want to keep scalability as a core pillar in our mind, we don't just worry about getting an OS installed this one time on this one box, but rather how to ensure we can do this in an automated fashion across hundreds or thousands of systems. And before we can do that, we should probably come up with a plan of what files should go where. You remember the here manual page from our last video. It tells us the file system layout and describes the hierarchy under which we place the various files. In there, we had noticed a difference between, for example, the bin and user bin directories. Everything under user is not needed at system bootstrap time, so it can be placed into a different partition that's mounted as part of the boot process. We also noted the presence of the var directory, which contains, well, variable data. But why would we care about having variable data under a separate directory or partition? To answer that, let's look at the definitions of different types of data. 
Now variable data, as the name suggests, is data that is expected to be modified during routine operations. So that includes log files, obviously, as well as the data in the user's home directories, for example, as we expect them to write to their files with some frequency. In contrast to variable data, we then also have static data, data that is not expected to change during the normal course of operations. This includes pretty much all of your operating system files, your libraries and applications. Sure, you may need to update those once in a while, but by and large, those do not change. And perhaps you already see where this is going. If you know which data changes and which data does not, then you can set up separate partitions and mount the file systems accordingly. Variable data, read-write with asynchronous I.O. to improve performance and perhaps no exec or at least no SUID. Static data, read-only. The separation then makes it more difficult for an attacker to compromise the system even if they get access, but it can also help you organize your file system across multiple hosts. And for that, you may want to further divide your data into shareable data. Data that, if you run multiple hosts, remains the same across all of them. And non-shareable data. Data that is necessarily unique to each individual host. Again, you can hopefully see why this might be useful. If you know which data sets are identical across hundreds or thousands of hosts, then you can think about how you can share it or deploy it or manage it in a central fashion, while the bits and pieces that are non-shareable need to necessarily be managed on a host-by-host -host basis. Here, let's look at some examples of these different types of data. We create a matrix, since variable, static, and shareable, non-shareable may overlap. So as an example of data that is static, that is, we don't expect it to change during the normal system runtime, as well as shareable, that is, the same for multiple systems, might be the data found under user, the common libraries and applications for a given operating system, as well as the data under opt, a popular directory or mount point for add-on software, not included in your OS or not managed by your package manager. These files should not change frequently, but would be identical across your entire fleet of systems in the given operating system. Shareable data that we do expect to change might be that under separate data partition we specifically set aside for a project, for example, such as var data or the home directories of your users. As we mentioned earlier in the semester, you might use the network file system to make shareable data available to multiple systems, and NFS mounted home directories are perhaps the most common use case here. Now, in the column for non shareable data, we'd list the system-specific files, such as the unique boot blocks or the system configuration files under Etsy, as examples of static non-shareable data, and the various runtime files created by processes on this particular host as examples of variable non-shareable data. Now, of course, these distinctions are dependent on your particular setup, but I hope you can see that it might be useful to plan for how you are going to manage your data in this fashion, and more applicable to this video segment's topic, that it'd be rather useful to have decided on this layout before you begin the OS installation, such that all the right partitions are created and the files installed appropriately. That is, we get our first taste of one of the more important aspects of operating system installation. Not so much the actual deployment of software or packages onto the disk, but the advanced planning of what to put where. But alright, so let's assume we did plan out our file system layout and partitioning scheme, and we now want to go ahead and install an operating system. You may be familiar with a screen like this, a graphical installer offering you a few buttons to click to install the OS. Now this is certainly useful, and it takes quite a bit to get to this point. We must have booted from some alternate media, loaded a temporary OS into memory, initialized the graphics hardware, and detected the correct display, and all that so that we can interactively ask the user how they want to install the operating system. But in this class we said we want to keep an eye on simplicity and scalability, and I think it's obvious that we can't easily install a few hundred systems if for each one we have to manually click on some boxes to start the installation. And of course nobody outside the individual consumer would use such a graphical installer. Instead, in the industry, we use deployment engines that are oftentimes custom built and that allow for the completely automated installation of an operating system based on the system profile. But to be able to build such a system, we need to understand what the actual steps are that take place during OS installation. So let's go ahead and perform a manual installation, but not using a graphical display, but instead using the actual commands that the graphical installer would invoke. So for this, we are booting a virtual machine of a NetBSD install CD, 
which drops us into a menu-based installer. This is still interactive and doesn't show us the commands. So we simply decide to drop out of the menu. This lands us in a root shell on the RamDisk OS booted off the CD, and we can now run all the commands we need to install the operating system ourselves. So first, let's identify the hard disk available to install the OS on. There, WD0 with a geometry as shown here by the kernel. From our previous videos, we know that we need to set up the partition table, so let's calculate the total sectors left if we start our OS partition at offset 63. And then use fdisk to set partition 0 of type NetBSD at offset 63 of the given total size. Next, we copy the actual boot code into the boot sector. And mark partition 0 as active. Then we create the BSD disk label. Since the editor environment variable is unset, we get dropped into Ed, the standard Unix editor. But don't worry, Ed is not that bad. It's just a line-based editor, so we have to specify the actions with line addresses. Anyway, here's what the disk label looks like right now, and that looks just fine. We have a single large partition for use by the OS, and in this case we have no need to change that. So we simply write the label to disk, and quit. Now we're ready to create the file system on the partition, similar to what we've seen in a previous video, if you recall. Ok, so now that we have a file system created on a destination disk, we can mount it. We use OAsync so that writes happen faster when we extract the data. Next, let's look at the data sets we want to extract. We see all the different tarballs here and can choose which ones we want to install. I'm going to leave out the X window system since we're installing a server and don't need a graphical user interface. So we extract all of these into slash mount, where our disk is mounted, together with a generic kernel. Next, we copy the bootstrap code into place, and install the primary bootloader for a file system with a 5 second countdown. Then we create all the device nodes under a slash dev and we're mostly done. Mostly because our system is now installed but not configured. To do that, let's shoot into it so we can treat it as a regular system and don't have to remember the path names under slash mount etc. See, here we are. Everything looks fairly normal. We need to adjust a few bits in etcrc.conf, the file that controls the system startup. On other Unix systems, that might be equivalent to inner D or system D configuration. Here, we enable DHCP NTP and set a host name. Then, we update etcf step to tell the system to mount the root file system. And 
Now we're done. So we can exit our root, unmount the disk, and reboot into a newly installed OS. When the system comes back up, we find our stage 1 bootloader here, with a 5 second delay we had specified. Our kernel boots up, DHCP does its thing, and here we are, up and running. Okay. So why did we go through all this work of running all these commands ourselves when there's a perfectly good installer provided by the OS? Well, as mentioned earlier, those installers don't lend themselves to automation. And what's more, in this class we seek to actually understand what the system does, how things work. And in the process, we can then extrapolate roughly just how OS installation needs to happen regardless of the particular Unix flavor in question. So let's generalize and run through the steps to install the system based on what we just observed. Obviously, we'll start with the system being powered up. As we've already covered before, there's a few things that happen, but at some point we'll be looking for a bootloader. If we're installing a new OS, then obviously we don't have a bootloader yet. So we need to boot off alternate media. In our example, and in the case of your custom one-time end-user scenario, that would be a CD. But for a scalable approach in a data center, you'd probably want to have your system netboot. Now this includes a bit of added complexity such as the system needing to obtain its network configuration and retrieving the RAM disk to boot into over the network, but we'll hand wave over this for the time being. Once your RAM disk has booted, you then need to identify the hard drive to install the OS onto, partition and label the disk, create the file system, install the boot blocks and make the partition bootable, and retrieve the OS itself. In some cases, this will be extracting the data from the local CD, as we showed, or in the data center, retrieving the data over the network from a local mirror via HTTPS, for example. We then extract the data onto the disk, perhaps add whatever additional software we might need, and then perform a little bit of minimal system configuration, just as we've shown. After all that, we're good to go and can reboot the system. Now these steps are more or less the same for most Unix systems that you would install, and they would only differ in the specific command you'd use to perform them. And having understood these steps, you can then automate the whole process and build a deployment engine, something just about every system administrator I know has built at least twice in their career. But perhaps you'll also notice that the basics of this process are really not complicated. Rather, the more difficult parts are happening elsewhere. That is, in order for you to be able to build an automated deployment system that can install an OS unattended across many systems, you need some sort of hardware inventory, a method to determine which OS should go on which hardware, as well as what software to add that's not part of the base OS. This may be accomplished by defining a profile or identities for your different workloads or images, for example. Next, you need to perform at least some initial system configuration and register the now installed system in your inventory before you restart it. But many of these steps here require a bit of infrastructure and organization around them. And once again, it's not always clear where the boundaries lie between how you bring up a new system and how you configure a running system. That is, there's some overlap with the larger topic of configuration management as well as service orchestration, topics we'll cover in more detail a bit later in the semester. And finally, you may also have noticed that we kept talking about an OS installation as if it was necessarily onto a physical or virtual server. But it needn't be. Nowadays, it's perhaps more common and certainly more scalable to build individual containers or OS images. That is, your AWS machine images are examples of where an OS is installed not onto a running system, but instead into what becomes a machine image that can be instantiated. Now there's obviously a bit of difference in creating a container for a process and instantiating a machine image, but perhaps you can see that the upfront work we discussed, deciding what data can be shared, what is static, etc., and the general steps we outlined help us better understand that process as well. 
So let's summarize what we observed. For starters, even though it may seem intimidating the first time you do it, the steps involved in installing an operating system are not very complicated. What's more, they're the same, or similar at least, across the board, which is why it's useful to go through the exercise of manually installing a system. Secondly, we saw that planning out our file system layout can help us streamline the OS installation process, improving its scalability and making it simpler. Logically then, the bulk of the work lies not in executing the same set of commands, but rather to identify the surrounding properties, factors and system aspects that need to be accounted for. All of that leaks into, as we said, with other areas of work and system administration, which we'll get to later in the semester, but which you may want to look into already to see how, for example, configuration management overlaps here. So a few exercises for you to improve your understanding and internalize what we covered so far would be to repeat the process shown here for a few different operating systems. Download the install images and install them into a VM. Follow their provided installer and note which steps they are executing. Then see whether or not you can repeat the process yourself by running the commands manually. Finally, think about how you would automate the process of installing these different OS. There are some tools out there that can help you. Research and find out what they are and how they work. Then, think about how this process differs from creating a machine image instead of installing an OS. How would you handle the host-specific bits in such an environment? What infrastructure services does the cloud need to provide to make this possible? As you can tell, you could spend a lot of time on this topic alone, and rest assured that system administrators everywhere have done so. In the process, we've all found out that there's a distinction between what makes up the operating system as provided by your vendor or open source project, and what ends up on your system. You will have to add more software, some of it open source, some proprietary, and some developed in-house. How we try to manage all these different components will be the topic of our next video, when we discuss package management. Until then, thanks for watching. Cheers! Okay, so this time, uh, after segment three, uh, and after we just finished up installing an operating system on our disk, we realized that there is more to than to that than just extracting a few tarballs no, into a file system. So in particular, we noted that uh, for our system to come up and be useful, we need to open times install additional software. <clears throat> bringing us back to the earlier discussion of what types of software there is <clears throat> and whether or not we can easily say yes, this belongs to the operating system. And note that an add-on. No? And uh, as we install such software, we may end up with our attempt of the manual, <clears throat> yung configure, no? make, make, install. No? Invocation being foiled no? by an unmet dependency, <clears throat> sending us on a wild uh, ghost chase of downloading dependencies of dependencies in order to finally get our add-on software installed. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the conclusion, there has to be a better way. No? Enter packet ma uh, package management, will, which we'll discuss no? <clears throat> uh, in this chapter. And uh, But before we get to that, let's first take a look at a few pieces of software and attempt to define their place within the software stack. <clears throat> so system software is a type of computer program that is <clears throat> designed no, to run uh, a computer hardware and application programs. If we think of the computer system as a layered model, the system software is the interface between the hardware and user applications. <clears throat> On the other hand, <clears throat> third-party software is a computer program created or developed by a different company <clears throat> than the one that developed the computer's operating system. Let's say, for example, <clears throat> any software running on a Microsoft computer that was not created by Microsoft is a third-party software. Computer programs that are supplied or developed for a particular purpose by a different company from the one that supplied <clears throat> or developed the existing programs <clears throat> on a particular system. <clears throat> they handle their accounting by mixing proprietary and third-party software. So an application that is provided by a vendor other than the manufacturer of the device, <clears throat> let's say, for example, the iPhone comes with its own camera app, but there have been camera apps from third parties that offered advanced features such as <clears throat> self-timer and simple editing.
So, as what we have here, no? let's say, for example, the system software versus third party or software, we have kernel, check, third party, of course, uh, or add on X, no? drivers, both, uh, check, no? firmware, system OS is uh, X, then uh, third party on no? LIBC, no? check, then uh, for system OS, then a uh, third party is X, no? The shell bot check no SSH SSHD bot check mail server yes bot HTTP server no questionable then uh, third party check <coughs> database X then uh, third party uh, check no Python questionable then third party yes add-on later on we have a demonstration actually with that <coughs> then for package no of the third party as what we have here now. <coughs> Uh, software types, no, as what we have, we have, we have the the hardware, no, the firmware, the kernel, no, the firmware, of course, with system software and application utilities, no, <coughs> for the uh, hardware is direct connect to the firmware, and hardware is also connect to the kernel, no. <coughs> uh, at the right side we have the package management, and the left side is the operating system, and add-on or third-party applications, no, like web browser, database, programming languages. So uh, we need to consider OS upgrade versus software upgrades no in this no at the same time in location of configuration files, duplicate or completing version the base system versus the add-ons, startup scripts, no daemons, no location of third party software, <coughs> dependencies, no installation by hand or installation using a package manager, and proprietary third party software. <coughs> So you you routinely have to build from source and repackage your <coughs> software. So always, uh, of course, it's all your software now. And implicit intrusion detection must also consider uh, and understand identification of vulnerable packages must be considered no. And <coughs> at the summary, of course, the comprise uh what comprises an OS, what is system versus add-on is not an obvious distinction. Uh, some dependencies are more tightly coupled. No, <clears throat> some required components, alternative options, are completely optional. Yet, convenient add-ons may be grouped into the OS distribution. <clears throat> Package managed uh, <clears throat> features, <clears throat> easy and scalable installation of software, automatic resolution of software dependencies, package and file inventory, package and file integrity checks, no vulnerability checks, and integration with the OS. <clears throat> So, you need to identify a piece of software you use, but that's not packaged for a given package manager. So, create a package for it, then contribute upstream. <clears throat> create a cheat sheet no, for four different package manager, listing the most important equivalent commands, such as install a package, update a package, remove a package, list contents of a package, no, and list the package owning the given file. <clears throat> Then we will be able, of course, to answer the following no, already. No, how does your prepared OS update firmware? How does the concept of reproducible builds relate to what we discussed earlier? <clears throat> and what is the overlap with system configuration? Can a package manager assert, assert state? No? <clears throat> and compare binary package management to building and installing an application from? Of course, with this source, no, stevens.net, me stores, no, that org, no. And this will be the link now for the software installation and package management, previous pre ports, no? uh, PKJSR source, or yung P PKJ source, no? of course, <coughs> Debian package management, no? Omni OS package management, and so on. Okay, so I'll just want to play a video presentation wherein you will be able to uh, understand uh, it clearly by demonstrating some of the functions as what we discussed earlier. Hello, and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. This is week 4, segment 3, and after we just finished up installing an operating system on our disks, we realized that there is more to that than just extracting a few tarballs into a file system. In particular, we noted that for our system to come up and be useful, we need to oftentimes install additional software, bringing us back to the earlier discussion of what types of software there are and whether or not we can easily say, yes, this belongs to the operating system, and nope, that's an add-on. And as we install such software, we may end up with our attempt of the manual 
dot slash configure make make install invocation being foiled by an unmet dependency, sending us on a wild goose chase of downloading dependencies of dependencies in order to finally get our add-on software installed. The conclusion? There has to be a better way. Enter package management, which we'll discuss in this video. But before we get to that, let's first take a look at the few pieces of software and attempt to define their place within the software stack. Here I've listed a few examples with a table to let you fill in whether you think that each entry belongs into the category of system software, or otherwise inherently being part of the operating system, or whether we'd consider the entry more of an add-on provided by some third party. Why don't you try to pencil in what you think fits where? Now, as you do that, you will probably need to take a step back and ask yourself, wait a second, just what exactly is the operating system? We had earlier said that clearly the kernel itself is not equivalent to an operating system, but that yes, you do kind of need one of those. An OS without a kernel is not really useful. Ok, so a kernel is not add-on software. After all, this is how GNU Linux came to be a useful operating system. All the other bits were already available, but a kernel was missing until Linus Torvalds released his Linux kernel under the GNU public license or GPL. But then, if we do need a kernel, what else do we need to have an operating system? In a modularized system, you can extend the functionality of the kernel via loadable kernel modules, and for certain pieces of hardware, you do need those special drivers. So those ought to be part of the OS as well. But you also sometimes need drivers that are supplied to you by the hardware manufacturer. Of course, the company that makes, say, your RAID controller needs to make sure their driver works with your specific kernel version, so there is still a tight integration. But as it may be proprietary or in either case separate from the OS, we have to put a check mark over here under third party. Now, what about firmware? Well, perhaps we should specify what we mean by firmware. The BIOS, sure, but also the actual firmware running on the RAID controller or your NIC. Now those don't need to be integrated with the OS, and while there may be tools provided by the OS to manipulate different types of firmware, that would generally be considered to be an add-on. Next up, libc, the standard C library. Now that is something that really needs to be quite well integrated with the kernel and all the other applications and services offered by your OS. Without this library, a lot of things will not work, and upgrading this library has the potential to break just about everything on your system, so clearly a check in the OS column. Now, while it's conceivable to install a separate C library implementation as an add-on, I think that would be rare, so we put an X into the add-on column here. What about the shell? Ha, huh, trick question. Now of course just about any Unix operating system comes with a shell. But you also might be aware that there are all sorts of different shells you could install on top, if you liked. So this one's a bit weird. The POSIX standard requires a shell to be present, a born compatible shell no less. But you could conceivably also build an OS without a shell, but ok, let's put a check mark in both columns here. How about SSH, both the client and the server? In a way, that's similar to the shell. Just about every Unix version around ships with SSH and basically all ship the same version of SSH, OpenSSH. But it's also possible to install it as an add-on or to use a different implementation. It's rare, but hey. Ok, next, mail server. Again, most Unix systems come with a mail server out of the box, which is a bit weird, because nowadays there really is no obvious reason why a standalone system or server should come with a full SMTP server. But this is an example of the legacy of the Unix system being primarily a very generic server OS for multiple users. And of course you can have multiple implementations, so it's also add-on software. How about an HTTP server then? Well, you'd think that'd be the same as the mail server, but traditionally an HTTP server has not been included in the Unix OS. However, increasingly more and more versions have added an HTTP server to the base system simply because it's become such a common use case. Now the HTTP servers included in many base operating systems might be good enough for low performance, low traffic sites, but if you want to serve some serious traffic, you'd likely install another version. Databases then are fortunately not yet included in every OS that you install and remain a primarily standalone add-on application. And finally, I listed Python here, as a stand-in for just about any programming language interpreter, compiler or environment. 
And that's another funny one, because obviously it's an add-on, you can download and install Python on any system, and even have multiple versions installed. Although the resulting dependencies for your software can get really annoying here. But also many operating systems do ship with it out of the base OS. This goes back to the standard Unix versions too, which shipped with a C compiler, even though nowadays it really is not needed for most systems. But the Python interpreter may also be required component of the OS, if some of the tools the OS provides are written in Python. So again, it illustrates just how difficult it is to draw the distinctions here. But seeing how most things are third party or add-ons anyway, why do we even care? One of the reasons is that we want to understand the dependencies between components. A coherent operating system that comprises specific core components and ships them as one coherent unit is easier to manage, to use or to upgrade than a hodgepodge of independent packages just at, that just happens to be deployed on the same system. And to resolve these dependencies, we oftentimes use a so-called package manager. So which of these components here would commonly be managed via a package manager? Welcome to the wonderful world of system administration, where the correct answer, as so often is, it depends. It depends on the operating system in question, as well as on the flavor of the operating system. Some operating systems do not use a package manager for the core OS, and only use a package manager for add-on software, while other systems use the same package manager for all components of the system, including the individual kernel modules or the kernel itself. But so let's look at how we manage software from a different perspective. Here at the bottom of the stack we're about to build sits the hardware. On top of that sits the firmware, managing and interacting with the hardware in some capacity. Next is the kernel, managing the hardware. We then have some system software, sitting on top of the kernel or otherwise being tightly coupled with it. Device drivers, kernel modules, core libraries, etc. But we also have a bunch of utilities and applications sitting here, such as the shell, all the common Unix tools we're used to, set, R, grep, etc. These interact with each other, but also may be used to control some of the firmware on the lower layer. Finally, on top of all that, sits what we call add-on software. Things like a web browser, a web server, or a database, or a different programming language environment, the AWS utilities, and so on and so on. Now, at some point, and that point is a bit arbitrary, as we've seen. We declare that some of these components are part of the operating systems, and others are not. It really depends on the operating system provider to define what they believe is part of the OS and what is not. But even for those components that are not part of the OS, we are still looking for a sane way of managing it, and all the dependencies between them. So we find that package management spans all of these layers. So we see that even if our operating system uses a package manager, it may want to use that to manage add-on software. But as you soon enough find out, once you've been running a system for longer than a week, there's always some software that's not available via your preferred package manager, and that you'll have to be careful how to manage that software. And so again, the distinction between what is part of the OS and what is add-on becomes more meaningful. For example, when you upgrade your OS, Will that lead to a system that's incompatible with your add-on software? The add-on software might install its configuration files in a location that you considered static when you designed your partition schema. Or the software you're adding may conflict with some of the core OS components, or you end up with multiple versions of the same software. You may have to adjust your system startup scripts to launch the third-party service at that system boot, or generally keep track of where the software is located what dependencies it has and how you tell it that you meet the requirements, meaning whether you can install the software via a package manager or by hand. And it's oftentimes easy to say, well, I always and only install all my software via a package manager, but sometimes you don't have a choice, because the software is available to you only as an opaque blob that you don't have much control over. So as a general recommendation, it's usually the case that you simply don't have a choice. Software provided to you in source form needs to be packaged up and installed to ensure you can express dependencies correctly, and even proprietary software can and should be turned into a package for your environment. After all, package management is really just a way of delivering files to a system while expressing requirements and dependencies to yield a final state.
We'll get back to this concept of asserting state, of defining the outcome, package x is installed, rather than focusing on how to do that later in the semester though. Anyway, since package managers are a critical tool in any sysadmins tool chest, let's look at a few examples of the functionality they provide. Here we are on the Stevens Linux lab, which happens to be a Debian-based Linux variant, so we can use the dpackage tools to manage our software. By running dpackage-l we can see all the software that is installed on the system, which turns out to be quite a bit. 1319 packages in total. But this is quite useful now, isn't it? Being able to list all the software that's installed together with a version of the package is rather important. So the first excellent thing a package manager provides is thus… a software inventory. Hooray! Okay, next, for any given package that we have here, we can list the contents of the package. For example, the TCP dump package contains all of these files. Not only that, we can also go the other way around and ask the package manager, hey, I've got this file here, what package does this belong to? So we get here a rather convenient method of looking up which files belongs to what package, forward and reverse. So this is the second excellent thing our package manager provides. A file listing and lookup tool. Yay! But unfortunately, this only works if the software in question was installed using the package manager. So for consistency, you really want to make sure you go to the trouble of packaging up the software you add here. Just think, suppose you want to upgrade Python on this host, but let's say the AWS tools require a different version and will break. Since the AWS tools were installed outside the package manager, dpackage can't know this and will happily let you upgrade Python and break AWS for all of us. So that's really no bueno. So take note, when you use a package manager, use it consistently or you lose many of its benefits. And there are several, besides just having a convenient inventory. To illustrate another advantage of having such an inventory, let's take a look at a different system. Here we have a Fedora instance, which uses the Red Hat Package Manager, or RPM tool. Like before, you can get the listing of all installed packages. 344 in this case. And get the contents of a package, like so. Now suppose we change one of the files in this package. Let's say etsy pam.d sudo to simulate a system compromise. That is, if an attacker gained write access to this file, they could change how authentication for sudo is done. Not something we want. So now the file looks like this. Let's also change the owner and group here. Now, how would we go about finding out whether or not a file like this has been manipulated? Remember that our package manager provides a full inventory of all files, but it has even more information than that, doesn't it? In order to install all the files, the package manager also must know the ownership and permissions, right? and probably also knows what the file size is and even what the contents should be. So if we have all this information in the package manager's database, then we should be able to look this up and verify the integrity of a given package. And indeed, the rpm command offers an option for this. If you run rpm-v, you get output like this. This means that the rpm command detected that the size, the md5 checksum, the user, the owner and the last modified time of the file differs from what it was recorded at installation time. How cool is that? We get an implicit intrusion detection kit here via the package manager. Nice! Now let's change back everything to normal.
there. Well, okay, the last modified timestamp still shows, but we know that everything else is in order. We can of course also run the validation check across all packages. And you'll find that there are some changes here. This may be entirely normal, since you may change the configuration files for several packages, log files will necessarily change during normal operation, etc. This hints at the fact that in order to properly monitor a system, you need to actually understand the context and know what the normal status is, so that you can identify whether any reported changes are expected or not. We'll get back to that discussion later in the semester, when we talk more generally about system monitoring. But alright, we get an intrusion detection mechanism, which is quite neat, but let's see what else we can do when we have a proper inventory of all packages in our system. In this example, we get back to a NetBSD system, where we use the package tools to manage add-on software from the package source system. As before, we get the listing of the packages. 177, in this case. But what I want to do now is figure out whether or not any of these packages have any known vulnerabilities. After all, if I have an inventory of the packages on my system, then I should be able to automatically compare it to a list of known vulnerabilities and see what things I have to patch. So that's the next really neat feature provided via a good package manager. Implicit analysis of which packages need to be patched by analysis of known vulnerabilities. All right. For that, we need to get the list of known vulnerabilities. And in this case, it is provided by the NetBSD project and can be retrieved via the package admin utility. Okay, so let's take a look at what type of file that is. gzip compressed text, it seems. Let's have a look at the data. Looks like a plain text file, easy to read and parse. It contains a listing of package name and version, mapping that to the type of vulnerability and a URL with more information about the specific issue. As you can tell, there's quite a few of these entries here. So let's try to run an audit. We use the package admin tool for this and... wait, what's this? It tells us something about not being able to verify a signature. Let's look at the file one more time. We note that right here at the top, it tells us that this information is cryptographically signed using PGP, which is rather useful when you want to be assured that the data is authentic and unmodified. But we can't verify the signature because we're missing the key with which this file was signed. So let's fetch the key from the package source website and import it. There. Now we can see if we can verify the data. Okay, we got a valid signature now. That is, we can verify that the file we have was the one that the package source security team published. But we haven't verified this key, meaning the GPG tool does not know whether this key with which the file was indeed signed is trustworthy. Let's change that. Since we fetched the key from the website via HTTPS, and we know that the location is indeed that which the package source team publishes its key, we can sign it. Alright, there we go. Let's try again. Aha! Now we have a good signature that we trust. Great. So now we can run the package audit. And here we go. Oof, that's quite a few issues the tool identified. Well, welcome to system administration, where just about any package or than a few weeks is likely to have a security vulnerability. Which is why it is so useful to have a tool that can tell us what they are, so that we can then decide whether we need to address them. Okay, so let's see. Bash over here appears to have a privilege escalation vulnerability, so we probably want to fix that. 
So we can use our package tools to pull in an updated version. The tool calculates what, if any, dependencies it needs. and then downloads the updated package, removes the old version, and installs the new version. So now, when we run the package audit again, we note that the vulnerability for bash no longer shows up here. Hooray! Okay, so let's break here before we move on to further discussions involving package management and some of the more hairy security aspects involved therein. What have we covered in this video? We've seen that what comprises an OS, what is system versus add-on is not an obvious distinction. We've seen that some dependencies are more tightly coupled, the kernel and libc for example, than others, meaning updating them requires coordination and compatibility. For others, however, there are multiple options, and what is grouped together as the operating system really largely depends on the provider. But either way, we've illustrated that all of this software could and should be managed in some coherent fashion. And a good package manager provides a list of excellent features, as we illustrated by example of the Debian D package, Red Hat, Fedora or CentOS RPMs, or via NetBSD's package source tools. Those features include the ability to easily install software and have the package manager automatically resolve the various dependencies amongst the packages. After installation and through consistent use of the package manager, we thus gain a complete package and file inventory, which we can then use to build package and file integrity checks, as well as a comprehensive mechanism to check your software for known vulnerabilities. Now, all of these features apply to OS as well as add-on software, so long as it's packaged consistently. So you probably want to make sure that you have integrated your package manager with the OS, meaning the package manager itself, another piece of software in our stack really, becomes part of the OS. Now, we aren't quite done yet with the topic of package management, and in our next video we'll continue with a closer look at language-specific packages, as well as a range of security-related concepts in this area. But before we move on to that discussion, let me leave you with a few exercises to consider. To begin with, it's useful to get some practice in building packages, since as I mentioned earlier, as a sysadmin you oftentimes have to do just that for the various software components that are not already packaged. So why don't you go and find one of your favorite tools, check if it's available as a package for your preferred Unix version, and if not, change that. I'm sure the upstream project will be happy to accept your contribution. Another useful exercise is to compare the different package managers, similar to what we've run through some of the examples on different platforms in this video. Identify the basic commands to perform the most important tasks in package management. Compiling a clear cheat sheet like this can be invaluable for your future efforts when you switch from one Unix version to another. Next, think about how we can manage firmware. How does your preferred OS handle this? Research the concept of reproducible builds and think about how that relates to our discussion here. That is, if you run the same package manager commands on different systems, will you always necessarily get the same result? What differences might occur? Then, think about how the management of packages overlaps or intersects with the configuration of the software. Can you use a package manager to assert the desired state of a system down to its specific configuration? We'll get back to this discussion towards the end of the semester, but it's still a good exercise for you to think about this already. And finally, here's a more detailed exercise you may want to run through. It includes a comparison of installing software by hand and via a package manager, and would like to give you a number of important insights into what we have to discussed here in this video as well as in the next. I know, this looks like a lot of work, but as I keep saying, it's up to you how much you get out of this class, and if you're interested in system administration, these exercises can really deepen your understanding and in addition be practically useful to you. With that in mind, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers! So right after seg segment uh, three, no, we we proceed to segment four.
And after in uh, our last video, you know, we sang the high praises of package managers <laughs> and illustrated their various useful features. Now, it's now time to shine a light on some of the problems we regularly encountered when uh, deal, uh, dealing with package management. Now, to be fair, <clears throat> many of the problems noted here are not so much inherent to package managers than to the larger. So conceptual issue on installing software, <clears throat> but it is <clears throat> worth keeping in mind just how fragile <clears throat> the operating systems uh, we routinely build uh, really are. So remember how we tried to classify software by type and group it into categories like the operating system and add-on software. Now we quick we quickly realized that it's not <coughs> straightforward. But okay, let's assume that we're using an OS that user a package manager for all components. So the OS and add-ons, and this should let us easily uh, manage all the software we need. <coughs> Okay, this should let us easily manage all the software we need in a consistent manner. But <clears throat> unfortunately, that doesn't always work out. If you are writing a lot of Python code, for example, you probably know that one of its strengths <clears throat> is that there are many open source modules and all sorts of cool packages to let you simply <clears throat> import anti-gravity. Uh, so without having to worry about implementing this yourself no but all of this module cannot possibly be shipped with the os and <clears throat> as the language environment open times move uh, significantly faster than the <clears throat> example an operating system release cycle uh, could keep up no <clears throat> with uh you generally won't find your anti-gravity rpm and now have to figure out how to install <clears throat> such modules no Excuse. Most programming languages encounter this problem sooner or later and end up a building up the native language uh, package uh, <clears throat> management system of sorts, complete with remote repositories uh, and all that. So now instead of looking for an RPM for your Python anti-gravity module, you might use PIP, no? <clears throat> which will uh, go and fetch your module, install it in the right patch. And of course... Uh, <clears throat> You don't have PIP, no? Uh, oh, no problem. You install it using easy install, which is Python package manager that you can use to have. It automatically fits modules and install them in the right path, no? <clears throat> uh, and will uh, you see uh, where this is going, no? It's a silly Python, actually, no? <clears throat> and you should be using uh, Node.js anyway, no? Right, now. Uh, but the point here is not to make fun of different languages, but <clears throat> to point out that there is an apparent need to rapidly and easily install packages for given language. And <clears throat> these solutions do not integrate with your OS provided no? <clears throat> package manager. Okay, so uh, this will be the native no, language package manager no, available. We have Go Language, Perl, <clears throat> and so on. No? Uh, so the dependencies, integrity, and trust, no, the OS provider's repository, and the language-specific community repository. <clears throat> this will be the curl, uh, HTTP, you know, colon, back, dalawang yung forward slash, no? <clears throat> uh, isn't any better nor hours than, ano, okay? Then tapos yun yung or niya, no? Then, <clears throat> this will be an example of RPM functions, no? We have lead, signature, header, Payload, public key, and so on and so forth. No? <clears throat> Remember, left pad, no? So this will be a module that export no left pad functions. <clears throat> this will be, a, of course, an example of an external and internal uh, libraries, no? <clears throat> and as you can see here, uh, later on, there is a demonstration of on how you'll be able to use <clears throat> the... Uh, uh, to find the code results, no? <clears throat> The step one, this will be the step one, no, get hub door king, no. And the step two, NPM does publish, no, the synopsis, then description, 
where in the description published a package to the registry so that it can be installed <clears throat> by name. So by the default, uh, by default, NPM will publish to the published registry, and this can be overridden uh, by specifying the different default registry or using a scope in the name uh, package.json. No? <clears throat> step three, after that's so waiting. No? So <clears throat> And step four, this will be uh, it's already no. As you can see no that the word compromise no. In most cases, this will be installed the version of the like, as latest on the npm registry no. <clears throat> then we need to take note that dependency are called dependencies because should depend on them. Mirroring untrusted and verified dependencies does not solve any of your problems. So integrity verification is meaningless without assurance of trust. <clears throat> so dependency, trust, and integrity is recursive. So this will be the possible questions. Now research the cited repository incident. How would you protect your environment from similar compromises or impact? <clears throat> so this will be your research out uh, requirement. Now what repositories do uh, the different package <clears throat> managers we've been, we've seen, used by default and how do we know that we can trust them <clears throat> if you use native language package manager how could you build cross dependencies with the native os package manager and of course later no uh, or next meeting we're going to discuss the multi-user fundamentals and authentication basic <clears throat> so this will be the link actually of the uh discussion of the software installation and package management <clears throat> left pad, no dependency confusion, RPM file formats details. No, so this time again, uh, for you to have a more uh, idea and then applications and demonstrations of package management pitfalls. So you just uh, please watch this video again. If you have some additional inputs, no cl clarifications, questions. Do not hesitate to post your question in our chat box for me to address as early as possible. Then if you have some additional inputs, also post in our chat box, okay? Hello, and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. This is week four, segment four. And after, in our last video, we sang the high praises of package managers and illustrated their various useful features it's now time to shine a light on some of the problems we regularly encounter when dealing with package management. Now to be fair, many of the problems noted here are not so much inherent to package managers than to the larger conceptual issue of installing software, but it is worth keeping in mind just how fragile the systems we routinely build really are. Remember how we tried to classify software by type and group it into categories like the operating system and add-on software? We quickly realize that it's not straightforward, but okay, let's assume that we're using an OS that uses a package manager for all components, the OS and add-ons. This should let us easily manage all the software we need in a consistent manner. But unfortunately, that doesn't always work out. If you're writing a lot of Python code, for example, you'll probably know that one of its strengths is that there are many open source modules and all sorts of cool packages that let you simply import anti-gravity without having to worry about implementing this yourself. But all these modules cannot possibly be shipped with the OS, and as the language environment oftentimes moves significantly faster than, for example, an operating system release cycle could keep up with, you generally won't find your anti-gravity RPM and now have to figure out how to install such modules. Most programming languages encounter this problem sooner or later and end up building a native language package management systems of sorts, complete with remote repositories and all that. So now, instead of looking for an RPM for your Python anti-gravity module, you might use pip, which will go and fetch your module and install it in the right paths and... Wait, what's that? You don't have pip? Oh, no problem, you install it using easy install, which is a Python package manager that you can use to have it automatically fetch modules and install them in the right path and... Well, you see where this is going. Silly Python. You should be using Node.js anyway, right? Right. But the point here is not to make fun of different languages, but to point out that there is an apparent need to rapidly and easily install packages for a given language and that these solutions do not integrate with your OS provided package manager. And it really is just about every language that has this concept. For example, long, long before Node.js, Perl had CPAN, and PHP had Perl and Peckle, which had a repository compromise in 2019. 
Ruby has gems, as well as a public repository that has frequently seen compromised individual gems. Go fetches code more or less directly from GitHub. And Rust uses the cargo native language package manager to build packages and upload them to the public community crate registry crates.io, using the country code top level domain for the British Indian Ocean Territory because that's what you use these days when you want to show that you're hip. We'll talk more about domain names and top level domains in a future lecture. But okay, so keep in mind that we have these different language specific package managers. Let's talk a bit about dependencies, integrity, and trust. We've seen the OS package managers, and we've seen the various native language package managers. Seems like we've licked the problem, no? Each one can install software, so what's the issue? Well, let's have a look. Here's a system that has a bunch of Python-related RPMs installed. So far, so good. We know we can identify which modules belong to which package and can express dependencies amongst them, such as, for example, that Python URL lib3 requires the Python IP address and Python 6 packages, and is of version 1.10.2. But now this host also has a bunch of Python modules installed via pip. This too is convenient, as pip shows us which versions of the modules are installed and also sorts out the dependencies between them. But now notice that we have URL lib3 installed twice, once via an RPM and once via a pip. And they're different versions too. So now things are getting interesting. Imagine that you have a tool written in Python that needs URL lib3. Which version will it pull in? And what if there's a vulnerability in URL lib3 version 1.9 that was fixed in version 1.15? Is this system affected? Which Python tool using URL lib3 on this host need attention? Does your host inventory correctly identify both versions? And how do we even get to have two versions of the same package installed? Our Python version here? is 3.6. But we don't even have a Python 3 RPM installed. The RPM version is 2.7. So now where do we find the Python that is not listed in the RPM database and also not identified via pip? Oh, here it is, under op-python. Which package provides this file? Huh, no package. Nice mess we got here, huh? And this is not even a very rare setup. You will find similar configurations on most production systems. And this doesn't even get us to the question of which version of which package is running in every single container you have. So we see that dependencies cannot be expressed, relied on, or tracked once you break out of the package manager. By the very nature, each package manager assumes that it is in charge of all of the packages and doesn't cannot know about similar software added in another way. But okay, so dependencies can become a problem. What about integrity? How do we know that the software we are installing doesn't contain a backdoor? You all have probably seen install directions like this, and oftentimes people criticize this approach because, obviously, pulling random code off the internet and running that as root is not a very good idea. But consider the alternative. The traditional method of installing software looked like this. You download a tarball of source, extract it, build it, and then install it. Sure, you could inspect the source code and the configure script and the make file to verify it doesn't do anything nefarious, but honestly, nobody does that, and it simply wouldn't be a scalable approach. So this really isn't that much different. Similarly, the various native language package managers do something similar in the background. They download some files and execute some scripts. Likewise for your desktop targeted package management solution du jour. Now one thing that you can do to make things a bit better would be to ensure 
that you use HTTPS instead of HTTP so that you get at least some authenticity assurance. We'll get back to that discussion in a future lecture though. But let's think about what we're really concerned about here. With the given examples, we fetch some software from the internet and install it, without having any assurance that the software is what we think it is. How can we improve on that? Now, your package manager may include support for signed packages. That is, the package contains some metadata that includes a digital signature, so that we can verify that the data we downloaded was indeed the one that was uploaded to the repository by an entity we trust. So for that, we need to again deal with asymmetric cryptographic keys, frequently using PGP. So here, this RPM-based system includes a handful of PGP keys from different entities from which we may want to install software. This key over here, for example, is the Fedora EPEL repository key that the Fedora project uses to sign the extra packages for Enterprise Linux. The RPM command can be used to verify the information embedded in the package, which includes a checksum of the data itself as well as a signature created using this key here. When we install this package, the signature is automatically verified, meaning we get assurance that what we are installing is what the Fedora project uploaded. That's great, and strong assurance. It means we at least know that the repository itself was not compromised, nor that anybody in the middle was able to manipulate the data in transit. So this topic of trust then quickly becomes interesting, by which I mean complicated. We trust the Fedora project, and thus anybody able to sign packages using that key, which may be an automated release system. But our trust also goes into a few other directions, which are worth taking a quick look at. I don't know if you remember the left pad incident from a few years ago. In that case, there was a widely used and surprisingly tiny Node.js module called left pad that could be used to, well, as the name suggests, pad text blocks on the left with the appropriate amount of white space. The entire module is shown here, 12 lines of code. It turns out this was a surprisingly popular module. Many other libraries included this module. But for various reasons, the author one day decided to remove the module, to unpublish it. Now, as the author, that's entirely his prerogative. But of course, that means that every single package that either directly or indirectly depends on this module is now broken. And so it turned out that apparently a third of the internet did depend eventually on this tiny little Node.js module. And various large internet companies encountered serious problems when the internal products could no longer be built. Now, aside from wreaking havoc on the internet, this provides an excellent illustration of the fact that if you depend on another module, you literally depend on it, meaning you break if it breaks or goes away. The NPN team put in some restrictions since then surrounding what happens when a module gets unpublished, but by and large this is a problem that's inherent in package management and requires you to understand the impact of your dependencies. But with a large number of public repositories used by the different native language package managers, repositories to which you just about anybody can upload anything, mind you, there are other concerns. Earlier this month, the blog post went around and described an interesting attack method called dependency confusion, in which the author was able to compromise a number of large companies by way of the logic employed by these package managers. The way this worked was really quite simple. In step one, you find out what types of modules your target organization might be using. A simple way of doing that is looking at the website sources or sifting through public GitHub repositories, which oftentimes include build information, such as what package a given module depends on. Turns out there's a lot of results, if you know what to search for. Now many companies have internal repositories that they use for their internal only proprietary modules but they also pull in code from public repositories. So once you know the name of a package that your target uses, but that's not been published to a public repository, you create your own malicious module and publish it to a public repository. When you do that, you use a large version number so that it may seem that your module would be newer than the version found on an internal repository. Step three is the easiest, and perhaps the hardest. You wait. 
You wait, hoping that at some point somebody will find and use your package. And what do you know? At some point, somebody is going to run npm install. Now npm install, as noted here, has the default behavior to always look for the latest version of a package. That is, if you find two versions, the one with the larger version number is picked. Which of course is exactly why you picked a large version for your malicious payload package. Furthermore, by default the command is configured to look at the public npm repository in addition to any internal repositories. So if you know the name of a package, create your copy and give it a large number, at some point, something is going to pull it in. Congratulations, you now own the host in question. Just like before, there are ways to address this. Not allowing pulling code from public repositories, for example, but it's not always easy. The main lesson remains that you do trust upstream repositories, whether you like it or not, and verifying the integrity of a repository or a package is something that requires more care or attention than most organizations pay it. So let's review some of the pitfalls we discussed in this video. First of all, it's important to remember that you indeed depend on your dependencies. That is, if they go away, you break. If they introduce an incompatible change, you break. And if you don't control them, then you are relying on others, possibly outside of your organization. Now to ensure that you don't pull in untrusted code from the internet, or that you don't break if some random person on the internet gets into a beef with the repository maintainers and takes their modules offline, you might decide to mirror an upstream repository internally. But that really doesn't solve that problem at all. If you are mirroring a repository, you are mirroring all its changes. Now mirroring can help you in some of the circumstances, but it does not address all of them and not completely. As so often, there is no silver bullet. Next, we've seen the use of signed packages and RPMs containing checksums, which is all nice and well, but unfortunately only solve one part of the problem unless you have established a trust relationship with the provider. I think I mentioned this concept in an earlier video. Finally, and this reflects our first point, you need to remember that all trust chains down to the weakest link. The integrity of your software build is gated by that of your dependencies. Now, we'll get back into the discussion around trust, integrity, and what to do about the various threats in a more abstract context later in the semester. But for now, perhaps try to think a bit about the incidents alluded to in this video and research what similar issues may have occurred before. Put some thought into how you might want to protect your environment against these problems. Take a look at the various OS and language-specific package managers and find out where they pull their packages from. What transport mechanisms do they use, and how do they assert integrity and authenticity? How do you know that you can trust them? And think about the problem we illustrated earlier, installing language-specific modules in an environment that uses an OS-native package manager. How do you record or resolve dependencies? As I illustrated, this is far from a solved problem, so there are no right answers to these questions, but they are all well worth your time to research. And with that, we're coming to the end of our discussion on package managers for the time being. In our next videos, we move on to discuss multi-user fundamentals, what it means for a system to support multiple users, and how that affects design decisions system administrators have to make, as well as a first discussion of certain authentication basics. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Cheers! Okay, so in this module, we have taken a closer look at how software is installed on a system. As we reviewed the boot process, we distinguished between uh, <clears throat> different type of software and identify a few distinct categories, now firmware and <clears throat> device driver, the kernel managing all hardware and interfacing with the <clears throat> drivers. Uh, a number of core system components as essential system tools, and libraries, no? <clears throat> basic application and utilities required to make the system usable, <clears throat> and finally, entirely optional add-on application. So <clears throat> the distinction between these categories has proven to be difficult to make, <clears throat> which is why we have further divided types of software by their place in the file system, hierarchy into the four categories of being shareable, unshareable, <clears throat> static, and variable. No?
we have looked at the steps required to install an operating system and discussed the need for a package management solutions to keep track of all files on the on the system as well as the implications of any required software upgrades now so a package management system a requirement for addressing a number of problems when maintaining large system with many pieces of software installed <coughs> does not uh, come without its price. However, as we have stressed, it is important to make consistent use of the chosen package manager, but this has become increasingly difficult. <clears throat> On the one hand, no configuration management tools are able to manipulate files owned <clears throat> by the packet man package management system on the other. Not all software <clears throat> you need to install is available <clears throat> in the given format, but, <clears throat> excuse me. Building your own packages from sources is laborsome, <clears throat> no? Or laborsome. Now, what's more, it can be frustrating as you are duplicating work already done by others to some extent. <clears throat> this holds, no? Especially true with respect to the many programming languages <clears throat> and to the many smaller components or modules available for them. <clears throat> Almost every modern programming languages nowadays include its own preferred way of installing language modules, including the search for and retrieval of the right version from an online repository. There is an old joke actually in which people lamenting the existence of too many competing <coughs> standards get together to create the <coughs> one true solution only to end up with just one more competing standard with <clears throat> limited adoption. We can see this holding painfully through when we look at how different language <clears throat> developers have all solved the same set of problem, actually slightly no? <clears throat> differently. So Perl has used its CPAN infrastructure for decades. <clears throat> Python used its PIP no, installer. Software written in the Ruby language is often provided as so-called gems. No? <clears throat> Note that JS uses its own package manager called an NPM. <clears throat> PHP application or extension are <clears throat> distributed using the peer, uh, peer framework and so on. <clears throat> Each of these tools allows a package to easily express its requirement <clears throat> on other language components. But none of this integrates really flawlessly with other non-language specific package managers. No? Uh, let's say, for example, no, uh, and it end up no uh, having to <clears throat> repacking this model uh, modules or risk of breaking their package consistent consistency model. <clears throat> Other uh, no choose to let yet another tool control the de the deployment of their software. <clears throat> More than once did we have to note that <clears throat> defining what software packages or version need to be installed on a system is not a one time act perform of an OS installation time. Instead, <clears throat> controlling what software is added or removed, updated, activated, or in other ways manipulated is part of an ongoing process and easily becomes <clears throat> part of the larger topic of configuration management. <clears throat> in fact, many configuration management solutions, systems that apply software configuration changes at runtime, <clears throat> include functionality to either require software packages to be present or are even able to install them as needed. We will revisit some of this aspect in the coming modules. Okay, so I think that's it for this topic because next time, <clears throat> next week we're going to discuss the module number five that is networking one. Okay, so I think uh, we are now, you are now ready to take the quiz now. Uh, and then the next meeting. But don't worry, I will share this video presentation.